kind of interested in for today are the hints about designing the experiments. And if you've been in my class for a year or two, you should be able to do this. Again, it's not going to be the whole 10-point question, but it's going to be some part of an essay question, perhaps. You might have a graph, you might not. You might have a design, you might not. But be ready for it if it's there, right? Design an experiment. You remember you have to do a few things. Describe the, the outcome. That's what? When you're describing what you think is going to happen. When you're predicting. Hypothesis. Thank you. Hypothesizing, right? Just make a prediction of what you're going to get. When you design the experiment, they don't expect you to be able to list every possible thing you're going to need to, to use. You know, I need a micro pipette and a this and a that. Just be as concise as you possibly can. There's a couple of things to remember. Make predictions about what the outcome will be. Make it realistic, okay? Don't make up some far-fetched experiment, you know, that would be in outer space or, you know, something really silly like putting a piece of bread in the middle of the room and letting it grow mold and that kind of stuff. You know, you want to have something that's more realistic. A couple of other rules to remember is always if it asks for, um, you know, like the effect of temperature, don't just give two points of temperature like freezing and boiling. That doesn't tell you much. If they want to see the effect of temperature on an enzyme, how many temperatures do you think you should give them? Not two, but what would you think is a good number? Five at least. You know, temperature and spreading out from, say, zero to boiling. And that way you get a spread, right? Now, you don't have to necessarily have 20 points of temperature, but at least, yeah, five. Remember, you get a little bit of a distribution, like, you know, standard deviation from the mean. It's possible if you have five points. Three is the absolute minimum, and I wouldn't even say that. Go with five. Same thing if you said uh, design an experiment to test the effect of pH on um, earthworms. Well, how many different pHs should you pick? I'd say at least five. Now, let me give you another reminder. Remember that temperatures like room temperature is not a control. Room temperature is a temperature, right? So you don't necessarily consider that a control. A pH of seven, which is neutral, is not a control. That's just a pH. That's one in the range. A lot of people make that mistake of just saying, oh, if I run it at room temperature, I'm running a control. If there is a way to run a control as a separate experiment, then by all means do so. Like if you're not adding an enzyme at all, what would be the effect? Well, that's a control. If you're putting an enzyme in with different temperatures, that's the experiment. Do the experiment without the enzyme. That's the control. Does that make sense? Do you remember that? Remember, you, you might be able to earn a, another point just by saying, replicate the experiment. What's wrong with only doing an experiment one time? You don't have to support Yeah. If you do it over and over and over and you get similar results, then you can calculate frequency, uh, the mean, the standard deviation, the chi-squared, the t-test, the z-test. You guys have taken statistics. You know that. So replication. Just saying that is, is a good one. <clears throat> and then, of course, you want to try to describe how am I going to know what's happening in this? Is there going to be an outcome, a color change, a gas, something? Describing that. So one more time. Make sure you hypothesize. Create something doable. In other words, make a range of temperatures, a range of pH, something like that. How are you going to collect the data? How are you going to know that it's actually happened and then replicate it? Those are all key things in design that we've gone over before. So I wanted to hit that before we go on to um, looking at something else. Okay. Now, you know, we're not studying fish anatomy today. That's not the goal. We want to design an experiment that will allow us to check metabolic rate, okay? 
Alex said check activity, like swimming. If that's what you want to check, design your experiment to check swimming. You're going to have to figure out how to do that. And how could you be consistent, like would you measure how many times they go back and forth in a, in a fixed container or swimming around? You have to decide how you're going to measure activity. Um, the one you suggested, breathing, and you said you can see their what? Their gills. Um, bony fish, which a goldfish is a bony fish, they have a little bony covering on the side that covers the gills, and they actually open their mouths, and they bring water in, and the water comes through the gills and covers them with hopefully oxygenated water. And the gills are able to extract the dissolved oxygen through their really thin little membranes. They have little things called gill rakers that open them, you know, make it so that they can um, absorb more oxygen. Now, what do you remember about surface area and absorption? The higher surface area, the more absorption. Okay. So fish increase surface area on the gills. Great example for an essay question. And then more oxygen can permeate through those membranes by diffusion, right? So you could look closely at the fish and either try to count the number of times they open their mouth, but probably more uh, accurate would be to look at the operculum opening. And let me just uh, try to show you what that looks like a little bit better. I'm sure you can see it, but it's this line right there. That is going to open. Now, how could you not just observe it, but quantify this? When you say quantify, what does that mean? Count? Get numeric data? So let's say I put this goldfish somehow in a container at uh, 20 Celsius. How can I tell what his rate of metabolic rate, or what would I really be measuring here anyway? Pulse, Pulse more like, I think this is respiration. Okay, like our version of breathing is the same for them, right? So what are you doing there? Flapping. Flapping your opercula, your gills. And that, how would you count it? How many? How many times I Per? Okay, or 10 seconds and multiply that's by 6 would be per minute. It's probably too, too hard to count per second, so you'd want to have a unit, right? That would be legit. Okay, so that might be at 20, the number of opercular openings. But how are we going to vary the temperature? Now, let's see. What am I going to do to vary temperature without killing this thing? First thing I might need to know is what would be a good range of temperature, Jessica. Do you think it would be a good idea to boil the fish? No. What is um, normal human body temperature? 98.6. What would that be in Celsius? 30 something. Yeah, 37. So do you think that might be a little bit hot for a goldfish? Yeah. yeah. So what I would suggest you do you is get the optimum temperature for the goldfish. You can use the computer and look it up. But I don't think freezing and boiling is appropriate. And I don't think anything near human temperature is appropriate. What did we say a minute ago about temperature variations? What would be a good number? Say five, but you could do more. And again, how are we going to do this? Do you think you should start with a high number? and go low, or start with low numbers and go high, is or it, just random? Is it different fish? Doing the finger test, huh? <laughs> okay, you're supposed to be using a... Microwave? You can use a hot plate or a microwave. The gloves are underneath the microwave. Hold on. Yeah. How easy is it to count? Gross, hold on. Since when? Now, how many times are you guys going to repeat your experiment? Four. Are you going to do four times, an average? You're going to use the same temperatures, right? I figured that. For each one? Yeah. Okay.